Welcome to uh, Innovation, Research, and Development, New Technologies, and Smart Investment Prospects for the Post-9-11 Age, the winner of the longest title and the largest panel uh, for any session of the forum. Uh, and I hope that we'll get more people in from the outside so we don't have the smallest audience either. Um, given the title and substance of this session, I thought I'd use uh, new technology for my introductory notes, my new iPad. Uh, I am Mark Pearl, President and CEO of the Homeland Security and Defense Business Council, and I'm incredibly pleased and honored to be part of this excellent forum. I want to thank Clark and the entire excellent, vibrant, and courteous support staff from the Aspen Institute for all that they have done to make this first ever event so successful. Everything about this forum is in line with the mission of the council itself. As Dave Abel said at the very beginning of our event yesterday, if you can remember back that far, uh, introducing the first session and many of the subsequent speakers, this event is about establishing a foundation of a substantive and engaging set of conversations, renewing and making connections and relationships with the realization that no one company, no one sector, and certainly no one approach, technology, intel, or personnel can do it all. Ours must be a holistic approach across sectors, disciplines, and even cultures. HSDBC's mission is to work to ensure that that holistic perspective of innovation, expertise, and capabilities of the private sector are recognized, respected, and integrated within the public sector work in Homeland Security. We worked with Clark to initiate this panel because we believed that the rapid and successful deployment of advanced security technologies is critical to the mission of Homeland Security. How we do that and the speed and efficiency with which we do that is critical to the overarching mission to secure our people and our assets. I've provided some in background information on the council that's located out in the foyer along with some information that you'll be able to find on hard copies of GSN. And it is my, now my privilege and pleasure to introduce a good friend of the council and to this forum to moderate this special session. Jacob Goodwin is the first and the only editor-in-chief of Government Security News. You'll be able to read more about his CV in the forum's program, but if you don't get GSN, to paraphrase another important DC publication, you won't get it when it comes to gaining a better understanding of the day-to-day -day security policy for our nation. And be sure to pick up a copy of that June edition, uh, highlighting the programs of, uh, in one particular instance, of an important informal group that some in, that are attending this forum may want to become active in, Women in Homeland Security, a group founded by my VP, Kristina Tanasicek. And now it's my honor to introduce Jacob. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, Mark. And I appreciate the fact that you did the commercial that I was planning to do for myself, but I, I'm, I'm happy you did it for me. Uh, I am the Editor-in-Chief of Government Security News. You probably have seen copies of our magazine uh, lying all over the place. Hopefully you'll take it. You might read it and uh, bring it home with you. And I hereby invite everybody here in the room. We're a controlled circulation magazine, which means it's intended only for professionals who are involved in the homeland security field. And that certainly includes just about everybody in this room. So we, we invite you to subscribe free of charge to our monthly print edition. Just go to gsnmagazine.com, takes you two seconds, sign up. And we also invite you to subscribe to our daily email newsletter, which goes out every day, Monday through Friday, to 50,000 readers. Uh, and I'd like you to be added to that list, gsnmagazine.com. Uh, we got a great panel today. And before I introduce everybody, I just want to say one quick word about these overall conference. As you probably know, because you've seen all these signs here, GSN was privileged and very proud to work with Aspen for probably the last year in helping to organize this. I certainly take my hat off to the Aspen Institute folks and to Clark Irvin for pulling together what unquestionably is the best Homeland Security Conference that's ever existed. I've been attending these now for seven years that I've been the editor of GSN. I've probably been to 50 conferences, and there's never been one that has come anywhere close to this conference in terms of the expertise of the speakers, the influence and an understanding of the audience, the content, the detail, the candidness, and the comfort 
of what we've got here. So I'm really pleased that this is going to become an annual event and probably the leading event in the whole Homeland Security field because it certainly deserves to be. Okay, uh, we got a great panel here, and the purpose of us uh, at this panel is essentially to uh, inform the audience here as to where things stand with the Homeland Security industry. We've heard a lot of talk in the last two days about the threats of terrorism and planning for it and what type of threats and what type of government and information sharing, but we really haven't spent a lot of time on the business side of the Homeland Security field. With me today are five individuals who are going to help uh, us come to a better understanding as to what is the business and industry side of Homeland Security. Let me quickly uh, uh, introduce our panel going down the line and then I'll get to some questions. Uh, we're going to ask each of the individual panelists to sort of uh, set the stage in a, perhaps a minute uh, opening remarks and then we'll get into some questions. But reading from my left to right, uh, you probably can see this in your uh, brochure, but on my immediate left is Rich Cooper, who is not only the chair of the Homeland Security Division of the National Industrial Defense Association, which is one of the major industrial associations in Homeland Security, but also happens to be the principal of a smaller firm no known as Catalyst Partners, which is active in this field. Further down is Devin Talbot, who's the vice president of D.E. Shaw. That's a large private equity firm, and he'll talk about private equity firms investing in this industry. A little further down, I'm sure I'll mispronounce his last name, Matt McHughie, and, then, and I got it. And Matt is the founder of Chart Venture Partners, which is very active as a venture capital firm, uh, typically uh, investing in smaller, more startup uh, companies than the private equity firms, but Matt will get into that in detail. Next down is Roger London, who is the chair of the American Security Challenge. I'm sure he'll explain that in his opening remarks. It's one of the innovative uh, contests and competition to find innovative technologies. And way down on my far left is James Beldock, who's the president of what's called International Shot Spotter, or he's the president of International, of a company called Shot Spotter. And that's a company that essentially provides urban areas with these innovative acoustic systems that can essentially spot firearms once they've gone off. So if you're in the middle of Chicago and a fire, uh, someone fires a gun in the middle of the night, his system can very rapidly, he'll explain it better than I, his system can very rapidly tell you where the gunshots come, that information can be given to the police. And we have James here because he'll represent a manufacturer and a security company and has a lot of experience raising money, exit strategies, et cetera. So we got quite an array of people. Let's start this way, folks. Everybody knows, I hear this literally every day for the last seven years. Everybody, when they, as soon as they hear Homeland Security, they say, oh, that must be great. It's a hot field. It must be a huge business opportunity. There was a lot of optimism about the Homeland Security industry when it started shortly after 9-11. Of course, the industry was there before, but after 9-11, there was a big push. So my first question to everybody, if you're willing to tackle it or if you're not, we'll move on, is really, What's happened in the nine years since 9-11 to the industry itself? Are the business prospects and the profitability from the company perspective what we thought? Is it better? Is it worse? Where are things going? I'll start with Rich. Uh, first of all, I want to echo your comments on the uh, program. It has been outstanding from every moment. This has been literally uh, information overload and enjoyment. Uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and on this panel. Uh, state of the market, um, when I joined the Department of Homeland Security in its private sector office, we had the charge of building the relationships with the department with the private sector because we were starting this big new adventure called Homeland Security, which no one was quite sure what it was. Well, the marketplace still remains one of those things. Well, we're still not quite sure what it is. Um, as we've talked about uh, here the past day and a half, the market, much like Homeland Security itself, is very decentralized. It's not just the federal department that we always hear about. And one of the things that uh, I shared when I was at the department and, and now in the private sector is reminding companies of all sizes that there is more Homeland Security outside of DHS than there is inside. And that goes to the very decentralized marketplace that you have across federal, state, local, tribal, and of course private sector up here. Homeland Security is a public-private partnership. We can't do it without each other in the private sector is there, but when I, if I had to sum up the Homeland Security marketplace, it's very small margins of profit, and uh, I, I wrote down here as it uh, kind of summarized this, I would call the market a residing frustration for a lot of companies that expected, I think, a bigger return than has been in, out there. Devin, jump in. So DE Shaw is actually a multi-strategy investment fund, so when, you know, I come at it from the perspective of an investor, when we invest in a company, 
Um, it can be in a range of ways, you know, either debt or equity. And they're typically more mature businesses. Um, and I've spent a decent amount of time investing in defense, security, and government services businesses. And I would say about, you know, it's tough to uh, look at Homeland Security really as a market. It is not, um, it is not a targeted, contained investment focus for many people. It tends to be ancillary to people who look uh, to invest in defense or government-focused businesses. In fact, when I uh, was preparing for this, I did a search in what's a, a rather large database of, you know, captures very small to very large companies. And of all of the industry classifications, and they go into pretty detailed subclassifications, there is no homeland security classification. And if you screen within business descriptions the word homeland security, you get about 1,000 companies. And if you screen again within that to you know, sort of a couple hundred million dollars of revenue, you, know, you get sort of 30-ish companies. So it's a pretty limited uh, opportunity set. Now, it's clearly an incredible opportunity, but it tends to be uh, sort of supplemental to larger defense and government-focused businesses. Okay, thanks. Uh, even though I sort of messed up and I, I omitted the opportunity for everyone to set the context and introduce yourselves, so please do that. And we, we need not come back to the question of, uh, you know, how we're doing over the first 10 years, but at least introduce yourself. Matt. Sure. Um, so Chart Venture Partners is a $100 million venture capital firm. We're based in New York City. And the firm was set up to commercialize technologies that are emerging from government R&D labs and commercialize technologies that are emerging from university labs. And so we really were, were taking the very nascent uh, patented technologies that the government is funding to the tune of $100, million, $100 billion a year um, and trying to find those, those gems that need to make it into the hands of of the security providers and the defense markets that also have large commercial market opportunities. And so um, we've spent the last four and a half years, we've done about 15 investments into companies in this sector. Um, and uh, they're at varying stages, but mostly the, you know, all the companies we invested in were you know, three, four, five guys and a, and a dog very often. It was a, you know, a university professor with a great idea. Um, and that's a very long road to get into the market. Um, and so our, our perspective actually is that um, Homeland Security is, is a tough market uh, in and of itself. Um, it's not readily understood, I think, by, by our companies. Uh, DHS has been a, a tough organization because of all the changes there. Um, and so really we've, we've uh, spent more of our time working very closely with DOD. And so a lot of the technologies emerge and then go back into the hands of DOD. And there's obviously a lot of crossover between Navy, Army, Marines, Air Force, and what the Homeland Security Office is doing. Okay, over to you, Roger. What kind of dog? <laughs> <laughs> Lab, <laughs> terriers. Um, American Security Challenge, uh, 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 we work with the public and private sector to help find uh, valuable security technology and try and accelerate the adoption of it into those uh, markets. We frequently use pilots. Uh, we get customer requirements that say we need uh, something like this, except it has to be half as big. Uh, we would then use it for XYZ. Uh, we go around to folks like Matt and incubators and angel groups and trade groups and try and find different technologies that match those requirements. So we're, we're this uh, eHarmony com, if you will, except it's just not electronic. Right now, we have 40 projects with uh, members of the defense community, the intelligence community, and cyber, C4, ISR, physical, uh, and energy. Uh, I think they've pretty well covered the, uh, the homeland security. I, I think uh, uh, the corporate infrastructure, uh, I deal with a lot of CSOs and CTOs and CIOs of the Fortune 500, and I think that they really have their act together versus um, the homeland security marketplace, the federal, local, or state, which is a very disconnected and disjointed, as we've said, uh, community. Okay, and last but not least, James Beldock. Uh, 
Thank you. My, uh, <clears throat> I want to start by reiterating something with a slight twist, and that is I've been lucky enough to be associated with the Institute for a number of years, and, and I want to thank Clark for finally bringing my day job uh, excuse to actually come here and, and, and participate in something. Uh, also, thanks for letting me join the Blue Shirt Club. Um, it's late. We, all, we agreed we had to wake everybody up in the crowd with at least one joke. Uh, ShotSpotter makes a, a, a technology, and we sell it to government entities. Uh, our technology listens for anything that goes bang, Jacob, not just gunshots, but explosions and other loud noises like RPGs and mortars being either launched or having an impact. Uh, we sell that technology. We originally sold it to the law enforcement market. We're now, by any measure, the, the largest in that industry by a factor of 10. Uh, we are deployed in 50 cities in the United States, all the big names, uh, including the nation's capital. In the, U in the nation's capital, we cover some 100 federal buildings of one nature or another, and, and that's what led us into the homeland security market. So that, I think that'll be what we spend most of our time talking on today. Jacob, to, to get to your question about what do we think 10 years or seven or eight years later, uh, I would say since, since I have been at a single entity trying to penetrate that market for mm -hmm. seven to eight years, my reaction would be that I think we all got it wrong on day one. Uh, we thought we were going to see a new DOD, a new Department of Defense that would have a single or one, two, or three purchasing entities within each service. So perhaps there'd be somebody at TSA and there'd be somebody at Customs and Border Protection. Um, that hasn't really turned out to be the case because a tremendous amount of DHS funding flows down to first responders and therefore state and local government. And so what we all thought was going to be a relatively centralized market that we could hit at the top and push our, our equipment through has turned into just as badly a fragmented market as the law enforcement or or really the state and local and municipal market itself is. Uh, I think that's been a frustration not only for investors but also for companies because instead of doing it once, we're doing the same thing over and over again, even though the funding is coming from one place. Thank you very much. I mean, it's, it's a good point and it anticipates the next question which we don't have to beat to death, but let's see if there's anything more to say. It, it really has become obvious to the, to the homeland security industry that they're not uh, defense light. A lot of companies, as, as James said, a lot of companies thought, well, we get into this business, we're, we're, interested, we're, we're knowledgeable about technology, we know how to sell to government agencies, so this will be another version of DOD sales. Turns out not to be the case. It's very decentralized. You're selling, instead of to three, to five, to six, to seven uh, federal military services, uh, offices or agencies, you're actually now selling to tens of thousands of police departments and emergency services across the United States. So. Clearly, many companies are, are frustrated and incapable of doing the job because they don't have nationwide sales forces to address 10,000 different customers. But, the, what else? but Go ahead. the companies that had the pre-existing relationships with public safety, uh, with the firemen, at, you know, whether they were providing them uniforms or radios, and I'm going to call one company on in particular, Motorola already had the pre-existing relationships with police departments and fire departments around the country. That is one company, I think, that was able to see the homeland market and think, you know, this is a great opportunity for us. They had all those relationships. It's the larger companies and even smaller enterprises, as has been mentioned here, knocking on those doors and putting in the legwork to build a relationship to complete the sale is the huge challenge in this market. I hear you. Any other thoughts or let's move on? Uh, We've heard a lot. I mean, most of you people in the room have already sat through two days of hearings and, and hearings, uh, two days of uh, panels. <laughs> it's a good trial. Uh, two days of uh, panels, including that very good panel on the actual threats. So again, I, we don't need to, to redo too much of the material, but I ask my panelists, from a business perspective, what do the companies that you deal with see as the threats that are out there that actually represent business opportunities? Maybe they're valid, compelling threats. You might have heard about them earlier today. But also, perhaps because there's not a solution, it represents an opportunity for a company to try and provide the solution. What do we know about threats and business opportunities that flow from the threats? Who wants to jump in on that? First, the first market that immediately comes to mind, and it was the market that everybody jumped on post 9-11, and that was communications, interoperable communications, that they recognized the faults that happened on 9-11 and police and fire not being able to talk. I think that market, I think we have bought possibly every conceivable radio that we have made on the planet since then, but we still have the interoperability challenge. But yet, 
you, consi you consistently will see more and more radios coming into market and you're trying to find, and you're still finding more and more outlets for those purchases. So that was the first market that I thought that came to mind. Um, the, I thought it was interesting in the previous panel, Senator Talent talking about the bio kits and the ready kits that might be out there. Um, that was an interesting piece, but yeah, but the funding for something like that is also, um, you know, caught up in a whole quagmire of politics that can't get out. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'll think offer a, oh, sorry. Well, let's let's, let's to, start with James, then we go to David. I'll offer a, a different and I think newly emerging field. Um, for 15 years, we've been finding things that go bang in cities, and so we have these days 40,000 gunshots a year that we're locating and another 100,000 explosive events or fireworks. That data, those data have lived in a silo for the better part of those 15 years. Um, in the past two or three years, DHS in particular has been aggressive in funding data interoperability, not just communications interoperability. Uh, as we've heard today, there are two problems. One, the amount of data living in my silo is now exploding to the point where we can barely handle it and we're the experts in that data. Uh, I, I, I pity the, 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 the federal officials who have to then aggregate thousands of data feeds and make sense of what I can barely make sense of with one data feed. Uh, the field that I think has not yet seen enough innovation is the intelligent data correlation and causative analysis. There's network analysis, there's lots of common operating picture stuff out there, but there aren't a lot of people doing real-time analysis of disparate threat signals and figuring out, aha, that's an event that's actually taking place, we should deal with it. Interesting. Devin? I was just going to make, uh, again, my perspective is comes from one of someone who deploys capital in larger, you know, more mature businesses. And so when we're looking at, you know, investing in a business, it, one of the challenges we find is as interesting as the capability may be and as pertinent to the various issues and challenges that have been talked about, you know, during um, the last couple days, is if there's not true advocacy um, in the form of both customers and contracted dollars behind those products, those capabilities, and ultimately those companies. Um, from someone in my perspective, it's, it gets difficult to, you know, really bank on that as a business. All right, let's move the conversation down a bit, sticking with finance for just a second. We have these two uh, representatives of two different niches within the finance community. Let's turn to Matt, uh, who represents the venture capital side. Matt, may, tell us some anecdotes or some stories about some of the investments that you've made, what you were looking for, why, that, why they look good, whether they cratered or they succeeded, but just bring us into the process of evaluating and investing in some of these venture capital startups. Sure. Um, so we've got one company uh, called Remote Reality that we invested in. It was a Columbia University spin out. And um, they make a 360 degree camera. So um, you can put it onto a vehicle and you can see all around the vehicle or you can put it on the table and have a video conferencing chat with every single person at the table. Um, one of their earliest successes was with SBINet, interestingly. So, um, we thought, you know, this thing is going to the moon. We, you know, we, we've, we've been invested in it for six months, and DHS is committing to them, and Boeing's taking them forward, and it's going to be on the Arizona border, and their and the revenues quadrupled in a very short period of time. We ramp up spending, ramp up hiring, and then, you know, the technology falls short. There are some changes that, that, are, that are, are happening, and as often happens, the, the you know, the company was not well situated to sort of ride the, the wave back down again. Um, now, fortunately, in this particular case, the, the, we, we were there, you know, we're, we had the resources to put more money in, hire more people to, you know, keep the company going. Um, and we've been able to go out and get a lot of SBIR support, like get a lot of Navy and uh, Army support for the company. Um, but I have to say that that spike upwards and downwards, that sine curve, mm -hmm. is really unhealthy for these companies. And um, you know, getting sort of committed support as you go forward is you know obviously the best thing for it. Um, that said, you know, the, a lot of the blame lay with the company. The technology was a little bit too early for what they were trying to do. So you know, the, the specs change, which often happens, and the, and the company just wasn't able to perform. So fair enough. A lot of, a lot of blame to go around. 
Um, Just out of curiosity, before you leave that subject, what happened to the management or the the uh, the original uh, <laughs> entrepreneur? Did he survive or did he uh, he's he no or she? He, he is no longer with the he's company. He's no longer with the company. All right. Um, which is also a very difficult part of the business is that you do have to go through a lot of uh, management changes like that. Um, but the story has, you know, as of now, it is, has a happy ending in that the Navy has found some really interesting uses for it in submarines, in the periscopes. Um, the Army is going to be shipping it over to Afghanistan for um, some testing for uh, use in Humvees. So when these gentlemen leave, or men and women leave from the Humvee, instead of being disoriented, not knowing where they are, they jump out and they know, they know, how, they know where the red barn is that they're told to go towards. Um, but there is a, you know, a lot of ups and downs in the entrepreneurial world. It's an extremely difficult place to live. Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot more failures than there are successes, and it takes a lot of uh, courage and risk taking and stomach to get through it. And you know, I think we're we're blessed to be in the states where the government steps up and the government steps in with with R and D funding. We'll, you know, collaborate and partner actively with the VCs. Who also have large risk appetite to help these companies actually get to the point where it's going to get onto a, it's been on a Navy submarine and it's going to be on um, it's going to be in the Army and that's that's a sort of that's the, the holy grail I think for all of us as taxpayers who funded the research at Columbia and we funding we're funding research at O and R we're funding research at NRL and we want to see that that technology actually gets into the hands of the war fighters and into the security community and hopefully commercial markets as well. We're going, to get, we're going to get to the topic of R&D specifically. I know a lot of people want to jump in on that. But before we do, let's turn to Devin and just see what the difference is when you're dealing with larger buckets of money and larger companies. What are the considerations? And perhaps you could also tell us about a, a, a case study or an illustration of a company and whether it worked out or, or, or tanked. Well, without getting into specifics around um, my portfolio, what I can tell you about is some of the things which on their face might seem problematic, but actually end up leading to pretty interesting opportunities. You know, it's not uncommon for us to invest in, in companies that essentially have, you know, close to one, one customer, one contract. That is not, you know, that is not a non-starter. You know, some of the most interesting businesses that we see, you know, really come up through one particular agency, as I sort of referenced before, they really have advocacy from one, um, one particular end user. And they are really deep in that, particular, uh, in that particular space. And it's you know, often a management team who's grown up in the industry, often you know, they're, they're ex-Intel or they're ex-military you know, health or something like that. They really know their space. And they've now taken what they've learned um, in service and, and taken it into the private sector and commercialized it. And that can be a really attractive um, platform on which to build a business. And so, you know, when we look at, um, when we look at opportunities, as I said, ca capabilities, customers, and contracts, the, th the three C's are what tend to be um, a, a big piece of our focus. And then, you know, management, you know, the integrity of management and um, you know, commercial investors who really know their business and are long their business and are interested in working with uh, someone like ourselves to really sort of professionalize and bring their business to the next level. I hear you. Thank you. Let, let's, let's pursue the conversation that Matt uh, brought up, and that is how effective are the agencies, particularly DHS and some of the other federal agencies, at sponsoring and inspiring research and development efforts that relate to the homeland security field. There, there's a whole bunch of ways in which the funding comes through, but two of the principal ones are something called the Small Business Innovation Research Program, which is intended for small businesses and, f and provides money under a number of specific topics. So they might say we now have to find uh, some fancy uh, thermal detection system intended for use in the battlefield or use uh, in an urban area. And they'll define it pretty closely and then ask for uh, small businesses to come in with innovative ideas. There's another concept called the broad agency announcement, which is more open to everybody, large, sm medium, small companies. But why don't I turn to Roger? I know he's very knowledgeable about uh, the funding for R&D and whether or not it's being uh, managed effectively. I guess that depends on what your baseline is. Uh, you know, Matt alluded to the amount of money that we spend every year on, 
on federal R&D, uh, it, it is somewhat effective, but it's, I don't want to suggest that we shouldn't spend as much money on R&D. For instance, startups are the, uh, the key to not only job creation, but innovation. There's a lot that's created in, in uh, universities and in the large corporations, but, but startups generally are the embodiment. You can't contract with a piece of technology or with an IP. You have to contract with a company if you're going to buy something. So we really need to foster more startups. Uh, uh, for every $10 million of federal R&D, how many startups do you guys think are, are created? I'm making sure you're paying attention now. None. Out of every 20 million, how many are started? None. The average is $77 million of federal R&D for every one startup created out of federal money. So, you know, we're always looking to, to do a 10 times incremental change in this technology or this technology. We should be looking at that. I mean, it, it, so. Uh, and if we're, if we're working on the startups, you know, the Kauffman study last year, I don't know if anyone's heard of the Kauffman Institute. Uh, it's one of the largest entrepreneur-focused institutes in the country. Uh, the conventional wisdom is small business is the job engine, right? Small business is where technology happens. Well, that's only partially true. Instead of studying the size of a company, they study job creation relative to a company's age. And they determined that two-thirds of net job growth happens with companies five years or younger. It's not universities. It's not uh, the lower Fortune 500 companies. It's with startups. Over the past 30 years, if you take startups out of the equation, we only had net job growth three years instead of 27. So uh, we need to do a much better job. You know, we need more folks like Matt who are going through the inventory at the labs, through the incubators, and finding interesting technology and matching it to the requirements, actual requirements, of the customer. Interesting. Who else wants to jump in? James. Uh, I would offer that, that if you go one level deeper than the $77 million producing one startup, there, there are a couple of, of, of fundamental causes of this, of this disease. And, and I think one of them is that there is a real disconnect between the funding availability, not that the money isn't there, but the requirement to show value for money, the requirement to show progress, and the ability for particularly small companies to execute with 100% reliability. Most of this is research, not development. Most of this is hard science, things that don't always work the way one expects them to. And if the program manager for the government has his head on the block after the first misstep, then that's the, precisely the reason why the next program at a startup doesn't get funded. And so one of the reasons you see this 77 to, to one startup ratio is simply risk aversion among the people who are supposed to be funding research and development and the hard stuff in the first place. Um, there is, within HR, uh, HASARPA and DARPA, the, the rules that are designed to, to force this not to happen, that, that failure must take place a certain percentage of the time. But that isn't universal through the rest of the funding. And so the, that 77 to 1 ratio does not come from DARPA and HSARPA. And it the, comes from elsewhere. And the HSARPA and the, the DARPAs, they're actually bringing the customers and the requirements closer to the R&D, and that's why they're more successful. I, I couldn't agree more. He brings up a great point, though, as far as the, the smaller entrepreneur. In this space, this is a very, this is a, this is a tough environment of which to operate. If you're the individual entrepreneur with a good idea or an emerging technology, the odds of you getting through this, what I will call a, a, a desert of, uh, uh, of desolate you know, challenges uh, to go through to you know, turn a profitability is, is really difficult. It's gonna require that small entrepreneur or that, that small company partnering with another company or being a, a, a part of a system of systems approach, your one piece of technology is not going to be attractive just to DHS or anybody else that's out there. It's got to be part of a larger system. And that's where it's such a challenge, I think, to get some of these new ideas into some of these spaces. And again, at the early days of this market, I think people were very enthusiastic about the new energies that would be there. But it takes an awful lot of time and patience. One of my colleagues up here talked about, you know, you've really got to have a stomach to deal with this. Uh, you, you really do. And it takes uh, a, an incredible amount of patience to deal with this. And you've got program managers with congressional members. And you heard about those 102 committees that are screaming and yelling, why didn't this investment pay off? 
not every technology investment turns around or is a success. This is R&D, as was mentioned, and you don't have a lot of degrees of patience with uh, political dollars in political environments, and ultimately all of these programs have to function in that. Thanks. But, a, a second yeah. order effect that I think is, is interesting for those of us in the industry, and that is that it, it pushes most companies to have some kind of dual-use platform mm -hmm. so that there is a homeland security or a national security use and then there is a commercial sector use. And in, in large measure, I don't know whether uh, Devin and, and Matt do this, but there are a lot of investors who will not invest at all in a company that doesn't have a dual use uh, structure. Now, that may indeed be reasonable for the majority of cases, but it doesn't solve the corner cases where there's a technology that really will only be useful for Homeland Security. And it's that place where specialized investors are required and better program management from the government with understandings of the commercial sector pressures. Yeah, if, if you're an entrepreneur and you've got a technology that's just targeting government, good luck to you. Yeah, there's a lot of fun. There's two, maybe three investors in the country who will, who will touch it. And, they, and then you're competing against the other thousand companies that are looking for capital. This is, this is not supposed to bum out any of the entrepreneurs who've got innovative ideas directed to Homeland Security for which there is not a civilian or dual use. Or the Blue Shirt Reality Club. <laughs> That's a, the Blue Shirt Reality Club. Before we go on with some other questions, I want to just ask the audience, if you, if you, if you can all wake up and uh, answer this quick question, I'd really appreciate it. How, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list five categories of people that might be sitting in the audience, and then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Uh, how many people, please raise your hand, how many people here uh, are current or past government employees or government officials? Wow, holy mackerel, thank you. How many people here work for the Homeland Security industry or companies similar to the folks up here? In, all right, a, a sizable number. How many people work for uh, non-governmental organizations or think tanks or non-profit type organizations? There you go, Clark. <laughs> uh, hands up once more, I'm sorry. Okay, a handful. And lastly, how many people are Aspen residents who are here because they live in the community? All right, another bunch. And anyone else I didn't know. How many people are anyone else? <laughs> oh my goodness, we've got a lot of anyone else, and I can't even imagine what groups they are. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I forgot the media. That's probably a lot, a lot of, there we go. Thank you very much. I, I, I was interested all for the last two days on front trying to get a handle on who's actually here and who's sitting in the room. Let's go on. Rich, when you mentioned the desert, where I thought you were going with the desert analogy was the growing problem that I have heard numerous times and we've written about in government security news, and that deals with the actual difficulty that companies in the Homeland Security field have in even communicating with the people they're trying to sell to in the Department of Homeland Security. I, I, I can comment on that, but I'm looking more for the comments here. There, there seems to be a, uh, a freezing of the communications in part because of people's uh, government officials' discomfort with, with seeming to be too close to industry. Uh, there's this whole transparency movement where almost every meeting between government and industry has to be logged and made public, and a lot of government officials don't seem to want to be in that log. So I asked the general question for anybody who wants to jump in on this. What could you tell us about the state of interacting with the customer? Can you get information about the requirements? Can you understand what they need, and are you able to explain to them what you offer. I'm going to jump in on this since you picked on me earlier, yeah. but I'm going to go back to my, my phrase of residing frustration. And I think Mark Borkowski did a wonderful job in the panel earlier talking about some of the challenges that he had as far as, you know, bringing trained program managers into the department to work with industry uh, members that are up here and, and out there in the audience. Um, you know, the department has had tremendous turnover uh, of its personnel. It's on its fourth chief pro it's, it's fourth chief procurement officer in seven years of business. Um, you know, having the, I have companies that I have worked with that have been through seven program managers in a year. And when you're trying to get requirements or satisfy a customer's demands and they're constantly being moved and, again, a company's trying to service them as best they can, it becomes an extremely difficult opportunity to succeed. 
And that's what every company out there wants to do. There is a tremendous patriotism by the American public sector, by the private sector, to want to serve those particular needs. I think, as you've seen at the end of each of these panels, you've seen industry people coming up here to talk to the government folks to talk about some of the solutions they have. But the mechanisms that are put in place right now, I mean, you talked about transparency. Yeah, I, I, now that's another conversation. But being able to find the persons that will sit down and be able to dictate some of those requirements, stick to some of those requirements, and, and allow those companies to serve that, that's a challenge. Any other thoughts? Matt. Yeah, the, um, so the intelligence community, for example, has Incutel. And Incutel acts as a, for those of you who don't know, it, it's basically the CIA, but it's also DIA and others. It's their venture capital arm. Ten agencies. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's expanded quite a bit. Um, and it's a great technology scout. And they are, they're like DARPA in the sense that they take really early stage risks. They, they, cover the, they cover the globe, really, but they're really deep in the academia. They know who's doing what. And they bring forward really cool, interesting new technologies to the intelligence community. We are, we are in, three or four comp in three or four investments with them. And they're great at pushing the companies through, getting program dollars back in. It's a really effective agency. Um, and I, I think it's very well served by Incutel. Um, the, Office of, of the Secretary of Defense now has a group called Da Vinci, which is about 15, 20 venture capital firms. And they'll come to us and they'll say, here are 35 needs that are unmet. Help us. Tell us what you guys see. We, you know, I see 600 companies a year. Other people in the room may see another 5,000. I mean, it's a really interesting way to find out about who's doing what. The, um, and I could go on. There's more examples. But there's not a good corollary in DHS. And I won't mention names, but there are people inside DHS who will represent to you and to our companies that they do a whole lot more than they actually can do. And so I, I'm sure those of you close to DHS, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it is really, uh, they're not serving the, the group well because they do present more of the monolithic approach. You know, come through me, I'll help you, I'll get you plugged in. Nothing ever happens. Um, and I think that the, uh, you know, be it expanding DaVinci to DHS or Incutel to cover DHS, there are ways to do this. There are mechanisms that are in place. The VCs want to be helpful. The public sector, Roger, is doing just this. His organization is just there to serve, you know, the people with the needs. And so I think, um, you know, maybe this is a good forum for people who are, who are in DHS to sort of talk about and try to percolate ways to uh, have formal mechanisms to, to bring the, the private sector and the, and the commercial sector. You know, you, before, you, before you say something, James, it, it's a very good point. If there happens to be anybody in the room, or some DHS people or former DHS people, who can address the question of communicating with industry and whether there are any inhibitions and why are there inhibitions and are they, in your view, are those inhibitions and the the reluctance to communicate appropriate or inappropriate. It would be interesting if we heard any, any commentary when we get to the question period from anybody in the room who, who can address that issue of communicating with industry. I can, Go ahead. I, I can offer one point from my time in the department in, in working with the S&T portfolio that originally S&T was not able to go out and talk about some of these requirements because they were classified. Well, how can you expect someone to deliver a solution to you if I can't tell you what I need? And so any number of times there would be companies that would be coming forward with solutions or technologies or services, and you'd say, no, no, I'm, I'm not looking for that. Well, what are you looking for? I can't tell you that. Now, that subsequently changed with additional leadership uh, at DHS s and where they started to put out some of the requirements documents of what they were looking for. But it goes back to the points that you heard mentioned, being able to actionally, to, to provide actions to put dollars into the R&D to get them into development, to get them into testing, and get them to market. There's a very short fuse of patience, you know, for any investor or in a political environment of which to do that. And I think DHS, unfortunately, has been, you know, a victim of a number of political tides that we're putting this money in. What are we getting out of it? James. Yeah, I, I think, in fact, there's, there's an inherent tension between the needs for security and particularly the need for people doing the work to be cleared and have clearances right. and the need or the desire professed by DHS, DOD, 
to encourage very small companies to innovate. The, the reality is that a small company will not get a facility clearance, will not be able to get its own employees on its own books. They can't afford it. You can't afford it. It's not going to happen anyway because you don't have a long enough business history, and you will be, you'll, you'll be mired in paperwork. We've been in business 15 years, 50 employees, and just two years ago finally got ourselves up on j -Pass. You know, that, that gives you some idea of how much of a pain in the neck it is. We could have done it probably five years prior to that, but we couldn't have done it in the first two or three years. And so that creates a disconnect where you can't do technology insertion because you can't find out what you're inserting into and what technology is required. That induces DHS to understandably go to the contractors who have people sitting on the bench who have the clearances, which means you end up with, with respect to the sponsors, people whose names appear on the board. Excellent place to do large-scale program development. One wonders whether all of the innovation can come from that sector. And until DHS in particular gets over this, there's going to be a problem. Certainly on the DOD side, they have solved some of this. It's a paid price for admission, unfortunately. I hear you. Uh, let's turn to the questions of liability. Everybody in the room, uh, unfortunately for like 70 days now, has seen the liability issues as they affect BP with a catastrophe in the Gulf. The same sorts of worries and concerns are on the minds of a lot of people in the Homeland Security and, of course, in the defense industry. Who can address the questions of the liabilities that companies perceive they're under, the Safety Act, which in part is designed to protect the companies, partially, and improvements that some people are talking about to the Safety Act? I know, Rich, you're knowledgeable, then we'll find someone else to add it into it. But jump in. The Safety Act, for those of you who don't know what it is, the Safety Act, again, classic government program, has an acronym. You can't have a government program without it. Safety Act, that stands for the Support Anti-Terrorism by Fostering Effective Technologies Act, hence Safety Act. The Safety Act provides limited liability protections for companies or persons or organizations, whomever they might be, that go to put technologies into the homeland security arena in which to mitigate against terrorism. Now, it provides those protections, again, and I want to emphasize this, only for acts of terrorism. And a company can go about submitting an application to the department, which can be a very onerous process, as uh, we're going to share with you in a moment here. And the DHS will go through the application and basically make sure that what you're saying about this technology is true, that you've done the testing and evaluation that's there. And after the department has gone through that, they're going to decide whether to give you, you know, certification or designation. Certification is what provides you the full liability protections that companies are looking for. Because when you go to operate into a space like this, the liability potential is tremendous. Um, at NDIA, the, the, the division that I represent and, and the firm that I uh, uh, am a part of, we tell any company that goes to work in the homeland security space, if you want to protect your investment, entering the homeland security market without Safety Act protection is really risking all of your investment to go up and smoke like that. Because as we just, just to, let me interrupt for one second. Just to make, it the exam, make an example, to make it more vivid. Let's say you're a, a company that's into decontamination. You're going to be the company that rushes in after there's a biological or a, some sort of chemical assault, and we got everybody is panicked and everyone is, is in a frenzy, and you're the company that's supposedly going to provide the magic foam that's going to deactivate uh, the chemical that was there. The notion of the Safety Act is, is if your chemical ends up killing more people than it saves, and you now have 10,000 victims who want to sue you for having this decontamination foam all over the catastrophe site, the Safety Act would say, wait a second, we evaluated you, we approved you, it happened in a terrorist act, so you're not liable. It caps your liability uh, at, your, at your level of insurance, so oh, let's, uh, let's right, qualify so, that. That's fine, so, that's fine, please do. And again, there are lots of nuances with the Safety Act, and for those who, uh, the department has uh, identified and given Safety Act protections to 400 different technologies. Now again, those who, the, there are a number of larger companies that have that, but also some smaller and medium-sized enterprises. They, these are companies that operate in security spaces, into areas where terrorism would be out there, and again, a company is looking to provide a solution. But entering this market, as I mentioned earlier, without a protection, something like that, again, every investor and every, every investor wants to make sure they can recoup on their investment. In an environment that is as volatile as you know, the national security arena, companies without those protections might not regularly go in there. And we want to have the best and brightest of technologies getting into the market, hence the reason for the Safety Act. Yeah, so uh, ShotSpotter just 
went through this. It was a several year process and, and finally got our certification. Uh, and I would, I would offer a slightly different perspective on what was motivating us. Uh, certainly capping our, our liability within the, the constraints of our insurance, which of course you then have to document to, to, to DHS, was valuable. Having a single liability venue is also extremely valuable. So having federal court jurisdiction on the majority of what you're dealing with reduces your risk space substantially. But there, there's a third reason, and, and frankly, it gets back to the same thing that the clearances are, which is that the Safety Act is effectively an imprimatur. It doesn't mean that DHS says this product works. It says that you've been vetted, that right. there is some level of, you know, these guys are not crackpots. Uh, they're not they're not charlatans, and so there there are you know, multiple echelons of 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 of, of sign off that one gets, and one of them is having security clearances, one of them is having safety act certification for your product that reduce in the government buyer's risk, sorry, in the government buyer's eyes the risk of procurement. So I, there really were two reasons, at least, that we did it. You will even see, and this has started to occur with a couple of RFPs. I know Los Angeles World Airports has put that in within their RFPs that they are looking for companies to provide services that already have Safety Act protections. Because again, as we've all seen with any number of you know, lawsuits that are out there, and we are a nation of you know, constant lawsuit abuse in lots of different areas, companies can truly lose it all. And when you want to put a technology forward that can create a solution or help you know, mitigate against terrorism, we want that, which means we have to provide some type of protections to them in turn. Okay. We, have seen, we have seen RFP requirements for Safety Act as well. Thank you very much. Let's turn back for a minute. Uh, how are we doing on time? About 30 minutes. About 30 minutes. Okay, good. And we're going we're to turn to questions, so dream up your questions in about five or ten minutes. Uh, hopefully, hit us with some hard, penetrating questions. Try to nail me or anyone here to the wall. Uh, Speak for yourself. <laughs> let's turn back to our finance guys and talk a little bit about the world of mergers and acquisitions. Let's assume now that you have companies that somehow have managed to get through this wilderness that we've been describing and you actually have a functioning, profitable company, whether it's a small business, a small venture capital that's up and running, or a, a larger, medium-sized business that might have a private equity investment. What is the current state of the, of the world of mergers and acquisitions for companies like this? Is there a market? Are they primarily thinking of being acquired by the larger companies, the Boeings, the Lockheed Martins, the Northrop Grumman's? Is anybody still thinking about IPOs? What kind of multiples, what kind of valuations? Take us into the world that you guys operate in. Let's start with the venture capital side. How does a venture capital company cash out and exit? And then we'll turn to the private equity side. Sure. Um, so first of all, the, the requirements for a company to get, a, to get acquired today have gone up dramatically. Um, you need to have a strong patent estate because uh, there's a lot of Me Too copycat technology development. And if you don't have some way to keep people out, you can spend three, four years getting into your big government program or into your big contract. That's a long time. That's a lot of time when other people know what you're doing. That's ample time for people to catch up and do exactly what you're doing, or, or quite, some, quite some of what you're doing. Um, James could probably talk about that. I'm sure you've seen some in your business. Um, we have 18 patents for a reason. Yeah, you got to have patents that will block people. So. Um, I think we want to be able to show to potential acquirers that we've got a, a position that will hold and they'll sort of be able to guarantee profits to the acquirer. Um, secondly, I, you, you mentioned before, Devin, uh, contracts. So it used to be enough that people were willing to take a flyer and say, it's really great technology. We think we can insert it into a program that we're bidding on and it's going to give us enough of an advantage that we can win a billion dollar program with your technology insertion. Now they're saying to us, because we have several companies that are talking to the large systems integrators and others, we actually want you guys to already be in a program. So the requirement for us is not just to build the technology, build the patent estate, and break into the market. It's actually win the big program. So for those of you who are in the government, you, you, you probably know, that's a two to three year process, minimum, right? You gotta build the relationships, you gotta build the confidence, Prove that it does what you do what you say you can do. Um, and so as a consequence, the impact on the venture capital industry is the window to get your companies acquired has gone from what used to be sort of a three to five years from investment to selling your company to now it's more like eight to 10 to 12 years to get to the exit window. Um, 
And so it's just a it's a very challenging environment, and I, I don't see that, that cha that's going to change anytime in the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Let's turn to Devin on the private equity side. I would say the good news is that the companies that are able to reach some uh, minimum scale that are able to sort of develop this diversity of, of customer and capability and contracts and also have some commercial use, the window is now opening and it seems to be opening in a very real way for meaningful exits. Um, and that's a function of a few things. Um, one, corporate America is sitting on the last I heard sort of $1.8 trillion in cash. So it's very easy for um, you know, large companies that see other pieces of their business really slowing to kind of flatlining, if not declining, to purchase and pay up for new verticals to essentially buy growth. And you're seeing that a lot in sectors, a lot of which we've talked about over the last few days, like cyber and, and Intel and ISR. Um, and in fact, uh, per pertinent to our sponsors, Boeing actually just today, and there may be someone here who can speak to this, but purchased a, a company called Argon ST for about $750 million. Um, they paid cash and they paid you know, a very healthy multiple. You know, they paid sort of... 35% uh, above. Yeah, 40, it was a 40% premium to their share price and I think it was sort of a 14, 15 times multiple on the cash flow, which is a metric that people use for valuing these businesses and to give you a sort of frame of reference, um, you know, Lockheed trades at sort of a six, seven times multiple. Um, another example, and again, pertinent to a sponsor, IBM actually bought a business not too long ago, which was a private equity backed uh, business. And it was a, a, a sponsor with domain expertise who had bought a series of small businesses with very discrete uh, capabilities and expertise and put them together you know, built sort of a professional structure on top of it, grew it to, you know, over a year, maybe two. And uh, IBM, you know, again, maybe there's someone here who can speak to that, but looking, I assume, to, to really build their, their presence and increase their exposure to the government market, um, acquired them and again paid a very healthy multiple. One other dynamic, which, which is... Like IBM. <laughs> It was, it was, people were very surprised to see I, IBM make the acquisition. Um, uh, one other dynamic is that on the private equity side, you know, part of one of the sort of subtexts of the, you know, the credit crunch um, was that private equity firms have been very aggressive uh, in the multiples they've paid, their use of leverage, and their ability to raise capital over the last five years. They are now, the private equity industry as a whole is now sitting on, you know, sort of 400 to 500 billion dollars of equity dollars, so capital they need to invest and they need to do it in the next kind of two to three years based on when they invest and when they raised it. There's a use it or lose it uh, dynamic to these dollars, which means you now have private equity buyers who are also being very aggressive in the marketplace. So all of this is to suggest that, you know, if you can get over all of the hurdles that, that the people are talking about, there's a, you know, there can be pretty attractive um, you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. From your Ro lips to God's ears. Yeah, exactly. Roger. If I could just uh, piggyback on that, we do a lot of work in the cyberspace and I haven't seen as active a seller's market as there is in the cyberspace right now with the companies anywhere from 15 and 20 million up, uh, uh, you know, the premium for uh, Argon was was uh, 35, 40 percent, but I'm seeing um, incredible multiples for smaller companies. Uh, the larger primes are trying to buy uh, 200 and 300 million dollar firms, and there's a limited number of those. So either they don't play or they they pay a premium, and that's going all the way down to the smaller firms too. Before we turn to the audience, we got one more minute to think of your questions, or two more minutes before you think of your questions. Let me go down the line here, and if you have anything to contribute, please contribute. Uh, on what you have recognized, or your perceived hidden niche, 
or some opportunity that exists, maybe it's some technology, maybe it's some need, it's something that's unfulfilled where you think, hey, either that's a company, tell us about the company, or at least that's a niche that you think there's gonna be greater growth than average. Who wants to start? Come on now, guys. Well, Intel Cyber is the obvious one. I mean, we are, I mean, I will tell you, we've looked at, at acquiring a lot of these businesses. We see them all the time. It seems almost like companies that, you know, might sell widgets sort of somehow slip Intel, you know, before and after and cyber after the widget just to, uh, you know, generate real interest. And it works. I mean, a lot of the companies that people are getting very excited about now are in this segment. And they're, you know, probably businesses that, that you know, which are, you know, a couple guys, some of them, you know, are coming out of academia and they've got one, you know, one interesting product and that's all they've got, but it's, it's focused on, you know, whether it's data fusion or, you know, cyber defense. There's some very interesting cyber offensive businesses mm -hmm. that are out there. So people are, you know, focusing on trying to solve some of the issues that are out there. And, and the, the large buyers are, are taking notice. I would, uh, Go ahead, Roger. I, I would add to that uh, email security. Um, uh, we could talk about energy later, but still staying on the, on the cyberspace, uh, email security is huge. Uh, and it's been mentioned earlier today about the data fusion, the ability to manage, analyze, and then present to a user in a meaningful representation huge amounts of value. We've got customers that are getting from different data sources terabytes of data an hour. So to be able to manage that, uh, and that goes to the high-speed process, but to be able to manage that and then make some valuable, uh, actionable intelligence out of it and present it to the user in such a way that they can realize that that's meaningful, that would be huge. Just to boil this down to a concrete example, so that this, this concept of real-time coherence, uh, particularly from, from disparate data streams, is, is you need no better example than the fact that halfway through Admiral Mullen's speak, uh, speech on, on, on Monday night, I, I just looked and found 12 tweets, three status updates, and a couple of Google News articles that had already pushed out what he had said. And, and if we think that it's just social media and the news acting in real time, then, then we're missing that it's also espionage and malefactors in general who are doing the same thing. So the ability to correlate, uh, you know, not just threats, but active attacks in real time and respond to them dynamically is going to be a big market. I'm going to pull on that thread. Uh, what I've seen in the emergency management community is you're seeing more and more use and incorporation of the tools like the Twitters, the Facebooks, et cetera, that they're using to push information to not only you know, educate the public about what's going on with a particular event, but um, uh, what's going on with the Gulf right now with Hurricane Alex coming in. They are pushing out information as much as possible to let them know where the hurricane is, reminding them that they should have 72 hours worth of you know, food, non-perishable food and water and batteries and all of those types of things. You're starting to see more and more incorporation of the use of those tools to, again, engage citizenry and every other interest group that is out there to make sure that they're plugged into this larger network of things that are happening. Okay. All set. Let's turn to the audience. Uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand and be sure to introduce yourselves. Tell us who you are. And let's get the microphone runners moving. Who wants to start? Come on there. Uh, gentleman in the back. Um. Uh, Mark Nichols from uh, Wesley Clark and Associates. Could you talk about the international marketplace a little bit and the kinds of uh, products and technologies that you see coming out of China and India and Europe and what kind of um, competition that could present to um, what you're funding and investing in here in the United States? Go ahead. One uh, practical example. Um, so you know, President Obama is uh, has approved, and the Congress have, have approved a very large broadband stimulus program, right, to bring broadband to the to the masses, uh, which I think is a great program personally. Um, and uh, the technologies that that we're um, were originally being deployed were primarily U.S. companies. And there's a company called Huawei in China, which is now so far ahead of everybody else. It's very difficult for the people who are, who are deploying these, the technology in the towers to 
put the 4G networks and the 3G networks into place. It's very difficult for the, for the US uh, equipment providers to compete. Um, and I think that that's a, a very small example in our, in our world where um, you know, they weren't the first ones to come up with the technology. They didn't, they didn't develop it. The R&D was all funded in the US. Uh, the innovation was here. But they've been able to come up with really fantastic manufacturing processes and do the incremental improvements that have really catapulted them ahead. We sure. see uh, out, of, out of China, we see a lot of the renewable energy uh, technologies and out of uh, Europe as well. Um, out of uh, Europe, uh, we also see a lot of smaller scaled nuclear technologies, 25 megawatts, 10 megawatts, sometimes portable facilities. Um, and out of Israel, uh, we see a lot of um, uh, kinetic technology. We see a lot of uh, cyber technology, um, a lot of physical security technology. One of the things that I've seen as far as companies here in this country that go to work in that space is that recognizing, it's, again, it's knowing your audience and knowing the marketplace. Um, there are, some of those countries have more civil liberties concerns than others. Some of those uh, the countries have more centralized emergency management types of functions rather than having all the state, local, tribal that we have here in this country. It's much, much more centralized in some of that. Um, and then some of, the, some of those countries are starting to encounter some of the liability issues that come into the deployment of certain technologies in certain areas and the exposure that companies might have. And so you're starting to see companies here in the United States that have been, you know, unfortunately had to go through liability issues, uh, having to raise those questions going into a new market to finding out what protections are afforded to them going in there. Um, in some countries, they don't have to worry about that. And a lot of others, as they become taking a look at the American model and how some persons are cashing in, you know, that has to be a concern. You know, there's a counterpart issue here, which is the competitiveness of American industry abroad, given the U.S. export regimes. And yeah. uh, first of all, for those who don't know, there are certain exports that are that are that are uh, overseen by the Department of State un under the ITAR process because they are considered munitions and listed on the U.S. munitions list. And then there are other exports that are managed by the Commerce Department under a various under several different sets of, of levels of, of strictness. Uh, just this morning, Jim Jones gave a speech in which he, he, he warned us that there would be a unified export regime in the U.S. sometime, uh, well, the administration's hope is to get two-thirds of this done by the end of the year. Uh, that might be the single greatest uh, boon and Im important development for U.S. security technology exporters. Uh, possibly in the last 10, 15 years, everything subsequent to the, to the uh, liberalization of the, export, of, of the encryption export rules. Um, it, it, it is very hard to describe the number, uh, the, the difficulty I've had explaining to foreign customers that I have the right to export the technology, that I will not get hung up in commerce or in state, uh, because commerce and state won't do that until you, until you have signed paperwork. Um, that becomes a catch-22. And, and if the government, if the administration and the government does succeed in rationalizing this process over, you know, they claim six months, but let's just say it's the next year, that could have a materially positive impact on U.S. security industry, and I certainly hope it does. You know, just one last thought on this gentleman's comment. Uh, looking at the trade in the opposite direction, and, and Matt sort of made a, a reference to it, but you have the whole issue of whether or not the U.S. government is allowed to buy equipment manufactured in certain countries, such as China, where, the, where it's prohibited. Uh, I'm, no doubt there's nuance to this, but basically the Buy America Act doesn't allow the, the Department of Homeland Security to acquire uh, cameras, say, that are manufactured in China. And so I remember uh, writing a story a couple of years ago where Panasonic, which is a Japanese company and used to manufacture its, its cameras, uh, video surveillance cameras in Japan, for its own internal purposes, moved its manufacturing to China to save money, and thus was unable to sell those cameras anymore into the United States. They made the decision that it's better to produce the camera more cheaply in China and we'll lose the U.S. government market. But they did, in fact, lose the U.S. government market for this particular type of camera because of the Buy America provisions. And you're seeing that more and more as it relates to any of the cyber procurements, that there's a greater sensitivity where they're getting any of the hardware or software. I think we beat your question to death. Right, right behind you, there's a fellow in a tan jacket. Uh, can you talk at all about the role of having to work with larger companies to sell into the government, whether they're large integrators or other larger entities? Because uh, it, um, it dramatically affects the dynamics of the return and the time periods. So can you address that? 
prime, big, big prime contractors like our sponsors. For a small company or for an investor to invest in a company? Well, okay, so, so speaking on behalf of a company that does business with Boeing and Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics, I'll, I'll tell you that it's a, that it, it's a separate skill set. Uh, there, there's the skill set of developing business with the government, there's a skill set of developing programs and requirements with the government, and then there are parallel skill sets in, do, in doing business with the primes. And uh, finding people as a management team, acquiring those people and hiring them is not of itself a challenge. Um, and, and certainly for us, we've been successful in doing it, but it took us a couple of, of attempts to figure out how to do it right. I, I, would, I suspect that, that Devin and Matt may have portfolio companies that have tried to do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's, and this may be something that's worth exploring in the homeland security space, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the defense world, is that, you know, the, de the def defense procurement has done a pretty good job, I would say, of creating various contracting mechanisms that once you're sort of blessed um, as a contractor to either a specific agency or sometimes government-wide, it, it actually becomes fairly easy to then sell into that particular customer. And we, and we will see often situations where the, the prime contractor is a Northrop or a Boeing, and this, the subcontractor is a much smaller company, you know, often ones we are investing in or looking on sort of mid, mid-sized businesses, but much smaller than these large prime contractors. And they're actually delivering you know, 80 plus percent of the work. They're the ones that really have, you know, the capability and the skill set. It's just the prime contractor who's got the, the license to actually deliver on the uh, program. If, if I can take your question in, in, in the following way, the first thing I would say to that company is one, what is the mission that you, your service or technology is looking to satisfy? And, and once that has been identified, matching that up with the systems integrator that has a specialty in that area or already has a pre-existing relationship with a DHS or a Homeland Security centric customer so that you can start to match up those things. Because again, the, when I see technology developers of all stripes, they have to bring them in and incorporate them into a system of systems that they've got to fit into a larger operating architecture that goes on every day. The operating architecture that we operate in this country is not going to change just because of one small piece of technology. It's got to be part of something else that comes into the larger network. Um, the other piece I would offer on that is that particular company also needs to look at what opportunities, how their technologies can be applied within the grant programs that are out. The other three letters to describe DHS are ATM. All the grant monies that go out, if you have a particular technology or service, identifying the grant programs by which a state or a local can purchase those things, whether in partnership with an integrator or by yourself, I think is inherent to a company's success in this market because most state and locals don't have the cash reserves of which to be able to make a lot of those purchases. The grant dollars are the only ways they can do it. Let me add to that also that, that we talk not so much in DHS, but in the intelligence community especially, and, and in DOD, there's a lot of the CTOs, uh, the, the CSOs, who uh, realize that it's difficult, uh, as James said earlier, you need a skill set to be able to, to work with a systems integrator, and a lot of small companies, they don't have the resources to hire that person, or they don't have access to the systems integrators, or they don't know how to articulate what they really do well. So uh, there's a great, I'm seeing a, a, a trend to try and not source all the technology through the systems integrators, and there's a lot of activities. One of the reasons our program might be successful is that uh, it gives the CSOs and the CTOs a way to actually connect directly with the technology that's happening without relying on the primes, not that there's anything wrong with that, uh, uh, for the source of the technology. Before I turn to the next question, if there happen to be any DHS officials active on the procurement or program management side or any prime contractors active on the subcontracting side, I'd love to hear your comments on anything you've heard this afternoon. Other questions? Gentleman in the back. I haven't heard much about security assurance in some of these smaller companies. What type of standards and what type of assur security assurance is uh, the government expecting out of small companies? I think it was mentioned earlier here that companies that are going to have to work in this space, one of the first measures that 
is going to be made, one, do you have security clearances to work within this space? Um, because they can only share so much information as far as requirements depending on whether or not you have that. As to the standards piece, um, you know, DHS does have the ability to issue standards in given areas, um, and they do work with standard developing organizations out there to identify select, period, select standards that work in particular given areas. One of the first things that they did um, in issuing standards came out on the fire hose couplings that um, uh, we all heard the stories as far as 9-11, outside jurisdictions coming in to help them fight the fires of 9-11. Their fire hoses couldn't connect to the city fire uh, hydrants because you know, the, the, the coupling was completely different. DHS did take the look uh, at, at putting standards out like that. They'll also use the standards by which to also get back to the grant dollars that if you're going to buy a particular product, you need to make sure that it meets a particular type of standard or requirement. For instance, um, you know, with um, uh, commercial tech or the uh, uh, emergency service radios, you know, you're going to have to meet the P25, uh, be P25 compliant uh, in order to use that money. But then you, the other standard of that is, if you're going to be selling that, you have to make sure that that whatever radio you go to purchase can be also interoperable with your neighboring counties and then be part of the statewide interoperability plan. So there's lots of other standards and things that have to be taken into consideration when you're making these sales along uh, the larger market. Rich, to the, to the point of data security for the company itself, as distinct from the functionality of whatever product we produce, um, I, I'd say that this is a real area, this is an area that really needs some focus. Uh, there are a hodgepodge of, of requirements, depending on whether you're selling to an entity that's funded by DOJ or DOD or DHS, uh, which cause us to have to have competing industry, uh, competing data security standards within our own shop when we're trying to meet the requirements of different agencies. For a bigger company, that's much less of a big deal. For a small company, it can be quite taxing. Um, I don't think that there's a solution because I don't think that those agencies will agree on their on data security standards for small companies. But uh, for yeah, they certainly won't agree uh, across the board. I, I would say that that companies that don't take this seriously, that don't take their own operational data security seriously, generally will end up not doing repeat contract business. Okay, another question. What do we got here? Yes, gentleman right there. Let us know who you are, please. Uh, sure, Joe Valencis with the uh, House Committee on Homeland Security. And uh, we have a lot of companies who come forward to meet with uh, congressional staff because they're looking for either some sort of directed procurement or um, just really are having trouble getting their foot in the door with the department. It's so vast. So um, here's my question for you. How do I know which one of the, there's only so many times I can go knocking on the department's door and say, here's a company you should probably meet with. How do I know? How do I know which of those companies are mature enough uh, to, that, to merit some of the department's time to take a, a solid look at some of that uh, technology? Because if we ask, they'll do it, but you only get to do that so many times. The first question I would say to you that you should ask that company going right back to them is, what is, your, what is your preparedness plan? What is your resiliency to be able to operate in this environment? If you're gonna be a company that works in a homeland security space, this is a high threat, high risk, incredible threshold environment that if you're gonna be able to, if you're stating that you can operate in it, are you sure you can operate in it? And asking what their plan is for their own continuity, let alone being able to operate on a bad day. I'm a personal believer that companies that do business with FEMA, which is America's bad day department, uh, you know, need to be able to have a business continuity plan or be able to operate in environments that are less than ideal. We know businesses can operate in ideal environments. When things are calm, when the seas are calm, and you know, the air conditioning's on, that's great. But can they go ahead and operate what is a very, again, high thresh, high risk environment, and let alone stand the roll in the barrel that occurs for every company that works in a homeland space? Because again, your company name, you know, if it doesn't work or it doesn't turn out that way, there are any number of wonderful reporters who will be able to take that company and profile that, you know, they didn't do what they were saying, or and they end up dealing with, you know, being maligned. Um, so my first question, that, that's what I would then go to them. The next thing I would ask them is, have they matched their technology up to what are requirements that the department has put out? 
I think DHS has, uh, their small business department does uh, an awful lot of work to try to educate these, the, these companies about what is out there, what are the opportunities. Um, there are any number of companies, whenever we have a disaster, you know, everyone's rushing forward to go ahead and wants to do business with the government. Can I interrupt, Rich? Sure. I think a lot of companies do this, and I, and I think your question is, is an interesting one, because he's saying, how does he know if this is the company that's going to be able to meet the requirements? Yeah. Well, that's where, again... How about after the references? You know, we we yeah. have probably yeah. several million dollars worth of contracts and, and performed on them with FBI before we even talked to DHS, and one of, the, one of the things we used as a credential was talk to the ASAC in such and such a place. Um, or talk to the SAC in such and such, such a place. And I think it, it's a little unfair, you know, it drives small companies having been on, on the other side of this equation. It used to drive me crazy that I didn't have such and such a three-letter agency backing me up so I couldn't get in the door at the next place. But the reality is that those references matter a lot. His reference point is the right one, though, because, again, I, I saw when I was in the department, even outside the department, people who put forward port security technologies that have never been to a port. <clears throat> or that think that their solution will operate in every port in America. Well, you know, if you've been to one port, you've been to one port. And again, understanding the operational dynamic, and that's where, again, Homeland Security is a grassroots effort. What have they done outside the Beltway in, and in the real homeland? Again, more Homeland Security goes on outside than inside DHS. The, the only, go ahead. I, I just want to say that this is a, a great example of what I was saying before about using the private sector and the government sector together as sort of the force multiplier for you. Because it, it's impossible, I mean, you can go through these questions, but it's, not, it's still gonna be difficult for you to know. Should you, should, is it, okay, you, you tell me all this, but I still don't know if, if it works or not. So you need a handful of folks that you can go to, yeah. like, like Matt, or without being promotional, that's what our organization does, is we score these things, and then we separate the contenders from the pretenders, and then it's up to the customer to figure out what they want to do with it. I mean, I think a little, this is, you know, maybe overly capitalistic, but I think looking at capital is actually a, a big criteria as well. I mean, you know, folks who invest in the space, whether it's, you know, in the venture end of the market or the, the larger end of the private equity market, you know, look at businesses all the time and they, they hire much smarter people than themselves, you know, often people out of industry to really ask these questions. And then they will also scrutinize, you know, the financials, the business model, all the things that go into whether this company will be a success besides just some of the industry and policy issues. Yes, uh, over here. Uh, Robert. Bob Mockney, Homeland Security. I, to answer your question, I think one of the we get a lot of vendors in our place. We have industry days on a regular basis uh, within U.S. Visit. Um, but I often ask them, what do you know about us? And, and they often don't know much about us. Um, I'll ask them, have you read the latest GAO reports on U.S. Visit? No, I haven't. And so on the positive side, con you know, Congress gives us lots of mandates on what to do. That's one thing you should know. But you should also about, you should know what GAO says to fix. And I don't always get that uh, warm and fuzzy um, oftentimes. So those are two basic questions I think to ask him is what do you know about their requirements? Thank you. Uh, any, any comments? Let's go to this gentleman. Dan Dunkel, New Era Associates. Uh, the last six or seven years I've been in the security industry, but I spent 22 years in high tech prior to that. From a go-to-market strategy standpoint, you know, you've got to get early customers fast. At least that's what the startups were about when I was doing them. So from the perspective of your, your VCs, what, how much leverage do you use, you know, boards, advisory boards? And from the standpoint of, of partnering with existing organizations that have relationships in DHS already built at a high level, because they've been selling them other things for 20 years, you know, is that an important part of your go-to-market strategy early with these companies? Or are you going more or less directly to DHS and, and, and talking to end users? Uh, I'm just kind of interested in what the, the go-to-market uh, idea is or thinking is. Uh, yeah, so, so the, uh, the notion of using a board of, of advisors and a board of directors is just that, that they're people who are subject matter experts who've got relationships and Rolodex 
that they can actually help get people in the door. Uh, now, very often, very often, um, you know, there's a, uh, people who we all know very, very well who sit on the boards or, or, or board observers for 50 companies. Um, now, so that's the, that's the, the theory. Now, the practice, I would say, is, um, James, I'll let you get, Anything but that. It's anything but that, right. And you, I know you had a guy who was very helpful to you in the early stages. But the reality is, and if you were in a high-tech company, you know this, there's nobody other than you who's going to make that happen. And somebody may even be able to help you open the door, but the S&T guys don't care. So it's got to, they, they, want to, they want to know, who, they want to get to know you, and they want to see what you have. Um, and so uh, we've really started to de-emphasize the use of advisory boards just because it's, it's a lot of work, it's time, it's money, and it's proven effectiveness is, is fairly limited. But you know, that said, it, it, it should, it should, it, the idea has a lot of merit, and so there are obviously going to be individuals who are willing to take the company on their back, I would hope, this is the, way, the only way it would work, take the company on their back and carry it forward and not stop until you've gotten an answer. Hopefully it's a yes, but a yes or a no. Uh, and those are the kind of people who we would you know, seek to work with. I, I would agree with Matt and, and add a, a slight twist to this, having done this and tried it with an advisory board. Um, if you're going to spend money, instead of spending money on an advisory board, I recommend spending money on fanatical customer service. This is a market that talks to itself unbelievably frequently. I've never seen a business, particularly cops, security officials at DHS, and, and, and federal law enforcement and, and DOD, I've never seen a market where there are the anointed and the unanointed as overtly and starkly as there are in this market. If you are a federal government security official, you talk to other federal government security officials, and the minute you are no longer in that position and you are past your one year uh, uh, period in which you have to cool off and not lobby the government, you, know, you really are no longer credentialed. And so if you're going to spend money to try to get in the door, the best thing you can possibly do is have your existing customers be your advocate. It but certainly worked for us. I will say that when, when, I, when a, a company in its life cycle gets to the point where I'm, uh, some, someone like myself is looking at it, where the, the company is profitable, you know, it, it's embedded with at least one customer, then it, it does become very important. And it's, usually, it's often something that when third party you know, professional capital comes into business that one of the early things they will do will develop an advisory board often to, to take that one customer and try and grow it out. I would add that as, as venture capital has dried up a little bit over the past couple of years, I've seen an opportunity grow with angel investors, a member of two uh, angel groups myself, but also in, our, in the D.C. area, there's a group of uh, former intelligence community folks, and they realize as a part of their investment that they're adding their Rolodex and their you know, human capital, relationship capital, and that's part of the deal. And I'm seeing more of that as there's less and less VC money on the street, I'm seeing more and more smart angel money coming in and playing an active role. Let's, I think we have time for one last question, and the gentleman in blue, you're part of the blue team, let's, let's close with you. Thanks, my name is Mark Goldstein, I'm with GAO. And we've talked a lot about requirements that uh, industry is waiting for uh, agencies to give them. But it's my experience in auditing federal agencies that frequently the agencies haven't done a very good job at all of articulating their requirements. They may not have the expertise to develop them. I've seen this at DHS and elsewhere. So I'm curious from your perspective how that can be improved. Sometimes, obviously, it's just getting more people in government who have the ability to do this. But I think that private industry can also help. Are there ways that we can improve how the federal government actually can articulate its own requirements and standards and improve what it's looking for in terms of performance measures and other things? I think Mark Borkowski gave an excellent description this morning about what uh, some of the remedies that are going on at the department as far as trying to build that internal capital that it has not had. Uh, and again, you know, DHS was an amalgamation of things that came together all at once, hit with lightning, and told to go make everything right. Uh, and again, it, it's, it's been, you know, a, a sharp learning curve. So I think what he offered was fine there. But I guess what I, would what I would say that I've experienced in chairing NDIA's Homeland Security Division is that 
you have an incredible desire by industry to sit down and talk to government folks about what they can offer and what is out there because we often will find is that there are government personnel who aren't aware of what that new technology is or what that next thing that is around the curve so that when they're going to develop those requirements for a future procurement, whatever that might be, that they can take those into consideration. That again, industry may be a generation or two ahead in the technology than where the government personnel may understand that. And I think we've got to figure out ways to be breaking down barriers to just sit down and have a conversation with folks without having to bring flotillas of lawyers, file freedom of uh, uh, you know, FACA uh, requests, uh, anything else like that. I, I have encountered so many government personnel that are so wary of even being seen to, you know, sitting down with an industry person to be even seen, you know, having a cup of coffee because that may be reason for a protest. Uh, and again, we become, we've got so many rules and regulations that they have, I think, really calcified and prevented the dialogue from going forward. So I think we also need to be looking at, you know, let's put some common sense back into this where it hasn't been that common. Anyone else? All right, I think we've uh, drawn ourselves to a close. Thank you very much, audience. Great questions. And I want to thank our panelists, uh, Richard Cooper, Devin Talbot, Matthew McHughie, Roger London, and James Baldock for your excellent participation. Thanks so much. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Enjoyed it.